if we look at the legal dimensions of the South China Sea issue, avenues for legal re resolution lead into blocked avenues and dead ends, in which politics perhaps matters more than law in terms of shaping likely outcomes. There are few areas in the world where so many claims, in this case, between the People's Republic of China, Taiwan, the Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, and Vietnam and Indonesia overlap. Most legal disputes in the world are bilateral. Southeast Asia is no exception to this pattern with bilateral disputes and legal resolution in operation in Southeast Asia between Thailand and Malaysia, Malaysia and Singapore, Indonesia and Singapore, and East Timor and Australia. This is where legality gives way to politics, since bilateral disputes are simpler to deal with through the simple fact of there being fewer parties to the dispute. In effect, it can be resolved more quickly through political will of just two parties who can then use relevant political machinery. It is various legal machinery that we can turn, namely the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, the UN Convention on the Laws of the Seas, Unchloss, the ASEAN PRC Declaration, of the conduct of the parties in the South China Sea, uh, made in 2003, and then proposals for joint sovereignty, pooling sovereignty, and demilitarization. All various mechanisms for these troubled waters. One possible mechanism then is the International Court of Justice, the ECJ, the legal organization of the United States set up to deal with the application of international law between states. In a practical sense, a logical response to this issue could be to refer the South China Sea to the ICJ, await its rulings, and then apply it. After all, there is a track record of ICJ role in Southeast Asia with regard to its rulings on the Temple of Priya Vihir in Cambodia versus Thailand in 1962, on the Pulau Ligatan and Pulau Sipadan Islands in Malaysia versus Indonesia 2002, on the Straits of Johor in Malaysia versus Singapore 2005, and on the Pedro Branco rocks in Malaysia versus Singapore 2008. It is in this light that in 2012, the Philippines and Vietnam suggested taking the South China Sea issue to the ICJ. Any ICJ ruling on the South China Sea would be likely to be slow in coming, perhaps not a bad thing in itself, and would likely to be something of a compromise, with no side totally winning and no side totally losing. However, the political Nationalism, territor territor the, uh, nationalism territory nexus, which operates, which is particularly noticeable with the PRC, generates sovereignty sensitivities over accepting any external competences, which weakens the likelihood of any ICJ adjudication being pursued by these rival claimants. However, politics immediately comes into play as states have to agree to put the ICJ, um, to involve the ICJ in the first place. While disputant claimants like the Philippines and Philippines have mooted involving the ICJ, the biggest claimant, PRC, refuses. Its well-known sensitivity to, sensitive, to sovereignty issues in general makes it loath to accept outside rulings particularly on issues of territorial sovereignty. Tennyson's logic from 1999 on impartial adjudication by the ICJ is unfortunately still persuasive now. That, quote, 
The impartial scenario will never happen, since some regional states, at least China, are likely to continue resisting external interference. Consequently, the Spratlys, or Dub Dubner's Rockapelago, could be made much more manageable as an issue by limiting their associated fields to 12 mile surrounding zones or even less, rather than such wider ranging 200 mile exclusive economic zones. Consequently, he argues, quote, the best way of resolving the conflict peacefully might be simply to agree that there are no islands, punch or style, there. With the Spratlys removed from the equation, Tennyson suggests that the EEZs, the Exclusive Economic Zones, could be and should be calculated from the coastlines of the surrounding states, and perhaps from the Paracel's main island, Woody Island, the site of China setting up a sanctuary city of around 1,000 inhabitants in summer 2012. This would leave a central zone in the middle of the South China Sea, where a joint development or management zone could be set up. An irony, though, is that China's current rejection of Japan's attempts in the East China Sea to upgrade Okinori from a rock to an island through adding extra concrete and buildings, and thereby gaining Unxlos generated economic exclusive zone rights, is exactly what China has been doing the places like Mischief Reef in Spratlys. However, Unslos is not necessarily the legal key in the South China Sea, in part because Vietnamese and Chinese claims are not just based on Unslos parameters, but rather reflect their wider claims to history based discovery and occupation, which <coughs> Unslos principles do not resolve. Admittedly, Unslos has got an adjudication mechanism in the shape of the International Tribunal the law of the sea, ITLOS, which was used in 2003 in Malaysia versus Singapore. However, UNCLOS has only been involved in much smaller disputes. It has only been involved in disputes involving two claimants. And third and crucially, it depends on states' willingness to submit to its adjudication. This is signally lacking in the case of the People's Republic of China. Another possible declaration, another possible legal mechanism is the 2003 PRC ASEAN Declaration on the Conduct of the Parties in the South China Sea, <coughs> signed between the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, and the People's Republic of China. It contains a general call for peace, Restraint and cooperation, together with exhortations towards confidence building measures, the maintenance of freedom of navigation at sea and air, and with negotiations to be conducted in accordance with international law in general and with regard to the UN Convention on the Laws of the Seas. In itself, though, it does not have any legal ruling. It has no legal bite, it has no legal sanctions. Admittedly, in July 2011, guidelines for its implementations were signed between ASEAN and the PRC. However, that still does not get declaration to the status of legal, um, legal fact. Another possible legal mechanism is establishing joint sovereignty. If the South China Sea is a question of dis disputed sovereignty over features, islands, which generate sovereignty associated consequences of territorial waters and exclusive economic zones, then could sovereignty be shared? No one would lose sovereignty as such, they would merely be shared. Some legal precedents for shared sovereignty do exist um, in past history. Uh, various examples, for example, New Hebrides in the Pacific. Uh, joint sovereignty between Britain and France from 1906 to 1980. Current condominium, condominiums include Luxembourg and Germany, France and Spain, and Brazil and Paraguay. One interesting comparison is the Caspian Sea, which was considered a condominium uh, 
between Iran and the Soviet Union between 1921 and 1940. Certainly, Townsend Gold quote, the only viable solution is to freeze the current jurisdictional position, allow the countries to maintain their claims as they are, but to re regard the Spratlers as a condominium. Another legal mechanism is pooling sovereignty in the sense of setting up higher joint authorities. The South China Sea could be turned into an area for scientific research and environmental protection, perhaps the, re the regional maritime park, this has been suggested. All sides could appear virtuous, a not inconsiderable factor for an image conscious China. The devil is in the detail, of course, insofar as immediate questions over representation allocation and current military facilities immediately raise their head. Exploitation of resources for mutual benefit have raised the possibility of proving sovereignty. One area for cooperation could be fisheries, as has already been mentioned this morning. Energy resources have lent themselves to such arrangements. The joint development area and joint authority body in the Gulf of Thailand was agreed in between Thailand and Malaysia. However, while both Track 1 and Track 2 discussions have frequently involved sharing the resources of the South China Sea Island, Islands, this has only been couched in general terms and has failed to materialise over the past couple of decades. Finally, of course, there is the option of militarisation, unofficially or more officially. Precedents do exist for this in other areas of the world. Again though, the sensitivity of the whole region militates against this. China is extremely um, unlikely to withdraw military forces and if China doesn't, neither will anyone else. Finally then, where does this leave us? Legal avenues for resolution, the ICJ, UNSLOS and so forth, do exist. But they are, are unlikely to be used given the politics and the strategic reluctance of most claimants. Especially the PRC, which may in fact be happy enough to defer any legal resolution now, while it carries on increasing its military strength in the waters, and ultimately then being able to impose a military solution over the Spratlys in the southern reaches, in a similar way to which a military was imposed on the Paracels in 1974. Equally well, political strategic moves by other states, in effect, unofficial balancing may in effect preserve a status quo for the immediate, indefinite future. Politics comes back into the question uh, with the question of domestic political change in the PRC. Regime change in which some of the legal avenues might then be more readily accepted by, the, by China.